Hello, friends, citizens, patrons of the arts, and lovers of fall weather. Does that rejuvenate you like it does me? I hope so, because it means you're probably interesting and smart and have cool Halloween lawn decor. Longer nights and lower temperatures inject me with new vigor, in spite of everything that's going on in this world. It infects me, you might say, with a renewed intent. Not the kind of intention a recent college grad sets when making a five-year plan. Not the kind of intent a recovering alcoholic contemplates when meditating. Not the kind of intent that a gentrifying white woman might stencil on a piece of reclaimed wood from a Balinese fishing boat and then hang in a yoga studio. No, this is a darker sort of intent. This is one that creeps up from the soles of my feet like an inky vine, tightening around my little heart until it just may blacken from a macabre joy. My name is Jennifer D. Corley. Welcome to Listen With The Lights Off, a radio horror show. And my intent is to share with you some delightfully dark radio plays. During this series, we'll be presenting tales that take you to unexpected places with absorbing characters from authors who fearlessly approach horror like a child diving onto a slip and slide. We're going to be playing for your pretty little ears what we used to consider conversation fodder for you and your colleagues at work or your friends at dinner, but now it's conversation fodder for standing at the bathroom sink and talking to your cat. Trust that the cat is tired of you. So leave the cat alone. Pour a glass of Chardonnay, IPA, juice box, whatever you drink, I don't judge. Put your headphones on, kick back, and turn off the lights. Our first story gives us a look at a fractured couple and is performed by Rihanna Basor and Solomon Maya. Enjoy. This is a ghost story by Juliet Escoria. My boyfriend's fiance is dead. Eliza is her name. She's been dead since long before I met David, but she still comes around. Yesterday was All Souls Day, so we went out to the graveyard in Queens to pay his respect. It was cold. One of those days with the sky so gray it looks like it's been baked in lint. The kind that confines you makes it hard to breathe. The trees hang crooked and thin this time of year. I wasn't invited, so I lay out on the couch while he was gone, listening to sad songs and smoking cigarettes. Seemed a good time to honor my losses, too. When David came back, the room was dark, and the needle was skating the edge of the record. That wears it down. Sorry. I wasn't sorry. I liked the sound of a spinning record. Reminds you things still go around, endless circles, endless chain, even when you think they aren't meant to. He sat down on the coffee table in front of me. I hadn't yet bothered to get up. He still hadn't taken off his gloves and there was mud on his boots. He said, So? But really what he meant was, What the fuck are you doing? Because I was just sitting there, alone in the dark. I ignored what he didn't say. So, how was it? He looked up real quick, and then went somewhere far away in his head. And then he came back. I sing songs to her because she used to like the way I sang. I spat whiskey on her grave and then I sat against the tree and cried. You never sing me songs. You never asked me to. And that was that. And then we had dinner.
The next day on the subway, I was going to work and someone sat beside me. Someone that looked like her, Eliza. Same long limbs and same fine hair. Same slight smile and same blue eyes, just like I'd seen in the pictures. She sat there next to me, her vibrancy, humming and doing tricks. This was a nice girl, all clear skin and clean clothes. This was a woman who was nothing like me. She looked whole and she looked happy. And here I was, late for work and neither of those things. Sometimes I felt I wasn't enough for David. But then I'd remember that when we met, he'd stare at me for hours, looking in my eyes like he was taking something from me. Sometimes I'd stir in my sleep, I still do. And he'd be sitting there just watching. The first time I caught him. You look so peaceful when you're sleeping. And awake? When you're awake, your eyes are wild. He took my sleepy hand, the way he does when he has to tell me some truth. They dart about and don't ever stop on something for too long. Like, you're afraid that by looking at things, you could break them apart could break me apart. He kissed me on the cheek, all tender like he does. And the whole thing was so sweet, I wanted to puke. But if that isn't love, well then I don't know what is. I couldn't bring myself to tell him the truth, that all that darting around had nothing to do with wildness. It was as simple as knowing he'd break me. I hadn't the magic to do that kind of thing to him. The next day after he left for work, I looked in the mirror just to check. There was no wildness. There was no power. It was only grayness. My heart stifled. My expression rolled out flat. The girl on the train, the one that looked like Eliza, was humming a little tune. I wondered if it was what David sang to her, and if they'd sung it together. It was a nice tune. Might like to hum it myself, but I'm tone deaf. Eliza's nail polish matched her lipstick, and her purse matched her shoes. My nail polish was chipped, and my shoes had busted soles and matched nothing. I wondered what would happen if I told her to shut up. She got off at the next stop, Wall Street. Eliza was probably a banker, would explain the fancy shoes. Not some perpetually broke English teacher like me. I was so mad that night when David got home, but he just smiled and stared and pretended nothing was wrong. We drank wine and I drank too much. At one point, I really did feel wild-eyed. While he was turning the record, I went into the bathroom to take a look at myself. So empty and wanting. And then I punched the mirror. David came running. What happened? My knuckles were bleeding. It fell off the wall, cut myself when I went to pick it up. He acted polite and pretended I wasn't lying. We went to sleep that night together, but alone. We did no eye gazing. We just stared at the backs of our eyelids, an act that doesn't take and gives nothing to no one. Eliza came to me in a dream again. 
She'd been doing that for a while, but usually I just ignored her. Tonight she was all white gown and washed out skin. We were in Queens, and there was a spit of whiskey on her grave. The liquor hung heavy in the air. What do you want? Eliza gripped me by the shoulders, and her touch was cold, and then she brought her face to mine. What are you so afraid of? I was quiet, because I knew she was expecting an answer, and I had to think. What I wanted to say was dumb. Except she was a ghost. So I only needed to say the words in my head. Everything. It's everything in this world that scares me. <laughs> That's funny. He's afraid of everything, too. She smiled at me. I'd never seen a smile so warm, especially coming off a dead girl. Eliza, I said. And by saying her name, her form became that much more solid. It felt good to conjure. It felt good to finally, for once, have some power. I said her name again, Eliza, and her fine hair blew upwards in the wind. Why won't you leave us alone? Her form was fading, and it was starting to rain. It was just me and her grave then. There was dirt on the stone marker and I scuffed it away with my foot. I still couldn't figure out why she fucking cared. I woke up right after. David's sleep hot body curled into mine. The light from the dawn streaked our room with shadows and the darkness licked us lying together in our bed. He looked so peaceful when he was sleeping, so small, that I thought maybe I could break him apart. Well, relationships can certainly be haunted, especially since Plan B hit the market, am I right, ladies? That was This is a Ghost Story by Juliet Escoria. Whatever emotions that brought up for you, compartmentalize them, because we've got another story coming up right now. It's a marvelously chilly look into our future, in case we need reminding of how bad things can get. Featuring Yolanda Marie Franklin, this tale leads us on a journey through a dystopian theme park. Strap in, and try not to think about how in a few years this might be a documentary. Today we go to Noah's Ark by Kayla Miller. Today we go to Noah's Ark. We have never been and we feel spiders underneath our skin in anticipation. After the Great Whites in 2022, we were more than a little giddy. We had been so scared of the water, so scared of the secretive teeth it hid. Now, we can be fearless. We can be thankful. We can have it all, the animals and the ocean. Because now we have Noah's Ark. There is a place for all things, surely, and now our place can be at the bottom of the sea. We don't remember who to thank, and unfortunately, history doesn't either. It seemed a colossal think tank amalgam, or a spontaneous ejaculation of collective unconscious. It seemed everyone's idea at once, and certainly everyone endorsed it. After all the world's great white sharks, both those known and documented, and those unknown, beached themselves in a mass suicide, we were glad. Some grieved, but we were glad to have the beaches back for good. 
Noah's Ark came next, and we were gladder because organization is gorgeous, and there is surely a place for all things. The gates to Noah's Ark are overwhelmingly high, thick as tanks. We have never been, and there is a buzz in our chest that thrums our excitement in time with the air conditioner's background belch. Louder outside than inside, we hope. It is a giant thing, housed far from the entrance, but still so audible, working hard to cool the massive arc in the 130 degree weather. Well, maybe it wasn't just the Great Whites. There were other precursors, signs that we couldn't be responsible stewards. When we killed a beach dolphin calf by passing it around for selfies, when we found the impossibly thin bodies of starved polar bears floating on melting ice islands, when the whales died of starvation with bellies full of plastic, Certainly, before the Great Whites, there was the Household Pets Act of 2023. After Ku Klux Klan members nationwide began hanging dogs alongside the bodies of black men, the government responded by instituting legislation to remove pets of all varieties from U.S. households, save select insects, after filing the required paperwork and pet rocks. Again, we were pretty giddy, but more secretly this first time. We feigned outrage. We mimed disgust. Public outcry did nothing to stop the removal of all household pets, however. Probably because we were secretly glad. So much responsibility. So much concern that we couldn't meet. Though millions of cats and dogs were euthanized, some 200 were saved for the Ark. We didn't know then that they were already planning the Ark, but when we found out later, we were even gladder. A place for all things is best. We feel our heartbeats picking up passing through the gate because here we can rent dogs by the hour and get all that love without the challenges of care. Inside, there is a world. Our eyes mirror astonishment at the world inside. So much more a world than the one outside. The entire arc is a length of some 100,000 square miles or football fields or something. We can't remember exactly. It is giant, and we know that much, which is enough. The arc is compartmentalized into three main sections, the earth, the water, and the air. We take off our shoes and outright rub our feet into the grass we encounter entering through the earth. We miss grass. Considering the significant population increase and the significance of the Ark, we are unsurprised to find millions of other visitors here. Like any theme park, there are long lines outside each habitat, which house one to hundreds of species of animals. Entire ecosystems thrive inside. We select our first line, the forest. We will see bears. <laughs> Remember bears. The wait is ours. Luckily, the ark never closes to accommodate its millions of daily visitors. It is our right to see the animals here, since we can't see them anywhere else, as long as we've got the $145.50 for 24 hours of individual admission. Next quarter... The cost of admission raises to $164.99. We have thought about this and saved for it, and it is tremendous. And we are giddy here now, in this line, as we wait, because the forest will be dark and cool, 
There will be trees, there will be deer and squirrels and bears and a stream and otters and fish. <laughs> we miss these things. The privatization of Animals Act came later and secured the ark for all the Earth's animals except for those raised by corporations for corporation purposes, which vary. The only animals allowed outside this ark are in factories and labs. After the Household Pets Act, we were feeling so free and light that we tap danced down our tarmix. <laughs> when they offered to take further weight from our shoulders, we thanked them. We are next in line after four hours of waiting. We will enter the forest. After this, we can pet the dogs. It is so lush and green, it is difficult to look at. We didn't realize we missed green, but now we do. The visitor pathway is fenced on all sides, but through the fence we can see small animals, darting rabbits and chipmunks. There are even birds. Only briefly do we spot a bear in the hundreds of miles of forest outside our tight fenced path. It is too far to tell what type, grizzly or black, but not far enough to make its bloody muzzle indistinguishable. We walk two miles through the forest, then turn around and walk the two miles backwards. We want more forest and more bears. We want the distance between us closed so that we can see what the bears have been eating. After the darkness and damp earth, we want the dogs and their lightness. We want a clipped lawn and sunshine, but also air conditioning. And we will get it. We can truly have it all. The line to visit the 200 dogs and cats spared is two lines. Dogs and cats. The dog's line is longer, six hours compared to the cat's four and a half. And we are happy to wait. The line sits outside a tall cinder block fence. On grass, we scarcely believe. The ark is all inside. There is no outside, but it seems so outside that no one notices, not even the trees and grass. Along the rope line, there are vendors selling cotton candy, donuts, lemonade, sports drinks, energy drinks, and our favorite gas station snacks, too. We buy crunchy, salty things and soft, sweet things. We smack our lips in anticipation. Some small children in line are too expectant. We hear them. They think that maybe, just maybe, they'll see their dog in that 100. We swirl grass blades between our toes. We love the feel of grass. And without any lawn to mow. The exit is on the opposite end, so we can't see those leaving. We are so close to the fence. We will pet dogs soon. <laughs> An attendant mentally counts heads as we enter, then stops the crowd a few heads after we pass. Nearer now, we hear gasp. Brief cries, snarling. We see the dogs. There are no fences once inside the cinder block gate, only close cut green and artificial sunlight and 100 dogs. The dogs are not smiling. What is wrong with these dogs? This is not dogs. Dogs are kind. They are friend. They are known to know us and we are here and they do not know us now. Now they do not know us. We see the whites of their teeth. Only now do we see the red muck on the ground. Only now that they're on us do we see their crazed eyes. We do not see the corporate accountant. We do not see the tremendous operating cost and even more tremendous profit margin. We do not see the attendant shutting the gate. We cannot see the sign now posted 
outside, closed for feeding. Goosebumps. Hey, at least those doggos are getting the nutrients they need. That was Today We Go to Noah's Ark by Kayla Miller. And it appears our time is up for today's episode, my dears. Please, please do join us again next episode for more disturbingly relatable stories that will leave you trembling in fear. And no, we don't mean your Twitter feed. This episode of Listen with the Lights Off, a radio horror show, is created by So Say We All in partnership with La Jolla Playhouse as part of their 2020 Digital Without Walls Festival. All the stories you'll hear in this series come from So Say We All Press's horror anthology series, Black Candies, created by the horrifically talented Ryan Bradford. Please do buy the books, available through our website, sosayweallonline.com. Listen with the Lights Off is produced by myself, Jennifer D. Corley. Editing is myself and Justin Hudnell, So Say We All's executive director. At La Jolla Playhouse, Jacole Kitchen is artistic programs manager and local casting director. Mary Cook is communications director. Amy Ashton is producing associate. Becky Beagleson is director of public relations. Mia Fiorella is director of sales and marketing and Nancy Showers is Senior Multimedia Director. Our intro theme is by Kurt Conan from AMFM Music, and our outro theme is by Daniel Schreyer. If you'd like to learn more about La Jolla Playhouse, visit lajoyaplayhouse.org. And to keep in the loop with So Say We All and become involved as one of our storytellers, visit sosayweallonline.com or just find us on social media. We hang out way too much on Facebook for people our age, but where else are you gonna find new blood? Until next time, I'm Jennifer D. Corley, and remember, if you find yourself feeling terrified and alone, there's probably good reason. Now, more than ever.